Now, um, after I shared my message last week about what was happening in Israel, one of the major themes that I shared was that it is a major distraction when it comes to prophecy. Now, I, I, don't, I don't want to minimize any sense of war or conflicts. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to do that one bit. It's, it's terrible when you see people's lives being taken, uh, especially over differences that, you know, probably can be solved diplomatically. Well, uh, as much as a distraction it is, the rhetoric about Israel's role in prophecy has only increased. Now, I was uh, glad to see that um, there's been a uh, ceasefire so that they're no longer launching missiles back and forth. But it was thousands upon thousands of missiles that shot back and forth. 250 people died over 11 days. Uh, you had thousands of homes destroyed, mosques and synagogues and um, just so much trouble. And, you know, and, and I suggested that, that, that these things, while it's happening over in Israel, and everybody's attention is looking at Israel, that it wasn't prophetic. Well, I want to backtrack a little bit because I have found in prophecy uh, some Bible verses that may just put it in a correct perspective. And so I want to take you now to Luke. Oh, uh, there's the, some picture of the conflict. By the way, this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, there on um, uh, the, what's called the, the Holy Mount or the, uh, you know, the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. So if, where, the, where that mosque is right there, typically uh, Jews believe that that's where the, where the temple used to be. And there's a rock inside of there um, that supposedly where Muhammad took some flight and there was some interesting history with Muslims. That's why it's like the, what, the third most holy site in all of Islam. And of course, in Judaism, it's a site where, you know, the, the temple used to be. So it's a very holy site for them. But for Christians, we understand that it's not holy. In fact, I, we used to, well, some people still do call it the Holy Land. You know, when they went on the tour. It was a Holy Land tour. I don't, longer call, I don't call it the Holy Land anymore. Maybe it's just semantics. I call it the Bible Lands because it's not holy. It used to be right? But the reason it was holy is because it was set apart to God's glory, but now they're, they're not set apart for God's glory. What's holy? We talked about it last week, is God's people, His, his church. So, uh, and that's what actually made the land holy, because His people represented Him there. And I want to take you now to Luke chapter 21. And I'm going to look in verse 8. This is a parallel passage of Matthew 24, uh, the, the, the sermon on Mount Olivet, Mount of Olives, where Jesus talked about the last days. He said these words in Luke 21, verses 8 through 11. He said, Take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Hmm. Therefore, do not go after them. But, but when you hear of wars and what? Commotions, conflicts. Do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. So, when you hear of what? Now, now the, uh, the Matthew, the way he puts it is wars and rumors of wars. So, prophetically, it could very well be that what we see taking place there in Israel and Gaza, as well as across the world in different lands, as a general fulfillment of these prophecies. Just like when we had this last year, we had a, a pestilence all year long, right? This disease, and, and of course we still have many other diseases still going around, pestilences on the rise and earthquakes and famines in these last days. So generally, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled, but not specifically um, there in verse 11, it goes on to say, verse 10 rather, and he said to them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes. Let me back up. And there will be great earthquakes in the various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So many of these prophecies have been fulfilled. Some of these we have not yet seen. In fact, these signs from the heavens. I don't know if I, I may have a, a message coming up. If you've been watching the news lately, there's been a lot of talk about UFOs. Anybody, anybody ever been seeing that lately? A lot, of, a lot of hype. But I think we've been desensitized to it. If you're like me growing up with Hollywood all the time, you mean all these alien movies. And so it's like, ah, what, what's, what's different about that? 
But a lot of people are, are really concerned about the idea of alien planets in contact with Earth. What's the implications of that for Christians? Well, anyway, I, I may get into that another time. But I wonder, the signs from heaven, uh, different things going on in the skies that people are really paying attention to. Again, people getting their minds off of God and His Word. But I do believe prophecy is being fulfilled. Uh, Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, very similarly, He said, "...and then many will be offended." Again, these are signs of the times. Many will be offended. Are we, I don't know that, we, that there's ever been a generation in earth's history that is so sensitive to offenses. Right? I mean, you say that. I, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I sometimes have to really consider, I shouldn't say sometimes, all the time I really consider what I'm saying, lest I unintentionally or uh, un... How do I say this? Uh, unnecessarily offend somebody. Because you, know, you don't just offend somebody because you can, right? That's not, that's, not, that's not the Christian thing to do. But the truth will offend people. And anyway, uh, we're living in a time where many will be offended, will betray one another, the lack of trust, and will hate one another. That is certainly describes our generation. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound... The love of many will grow cold. The Bible has predicted, especially there, in, uh, you see in Daniel chapter 7, uh, this little horn rises up and tries to make of none effect God's commandments. We see him casting truth to the ground. Lawlessness, rebellion against God's law. I mean, before the flood it was bad, but I got to say, and I, I, I wasn't there. We only have the few Bible verses to describe it. But I can look around this world right now and see that there, the lawlessness abounds. This, isn't in, this has been fulfilled and in fulfillment right now. It goes on to say, but he who endures unto the end shall be saved. He who continues on, this is the patience of the saints. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world is witness to all nations, and then the end will come. This, my friends, is the three angels' messages. This gospel that goes to the whole world isn't just any gospel. This is what uh, John calls the everlasting gospel that goes to all the ends of the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is a worldwide message, a gospel message that, 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 that's about transforming people. It's, not, it's, it's a gospel of justification and a gospel of sanctification. So many priests, just, just one without the other. Friends, we are living in a time of lawlessness, but we are also living in the gospel time when, when the truth is really transforming and changing people's lives. Deception abounds. In fact, that was the first words out of Jesus' mouth. See that you do not be deceived those teaching false prophecies about Israel today, I found it very interesting as I was kind of doing a little survey of what the different preachers were saying about what was happening over in Israel this past Sunday, right? You know, Sunday morning they all come out and talking about Israel, just like I came out Saturday morning talking about Israel. And most of them are saying, it's really interesting, they get all excited and they're like, you know, we're back in Israel and fight for Israel and they got a right to defend themselves and get very political and, and, and like God has raised them up and this is God's people. And, and you know, actually one, one, mess, one uh, preacher, he really went at length to try to prove that the church is not Israel. Like, like even though we made a good case last Sabbath that the church is Israel, they're trying to make the opposite case that the church is not Israel, that God is, is using that nation over there that, that's lawless themselves, that just rejects Jesus, that that's still God's holy, peculiar people today. That's not the truth. That's not what the Bible says. Well, anyway, as I'm listening to these guys, it's like they get all excited about this, but then they, then they say something that just amazes me, and that's this. But we're not going to be here during all this time. They said the church is going to be raptured out of here and that's whenever God saves Israel. That's when they get converted, right? That's what they, that's what they teach. <sighs> All this focus on Israel, and then they're just saying, hey, but the church is going to be out of here anyway. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't get the, the logic in that. 
But all this deception about last day events, friends, we need to study our Bibles. We need to know what the God's Word says for ourselves. We cannot any longer take our preacher's word for it, our, our Sabbath school teacher's word for it, our Bible school, our Bible teachers. We can't take their word for it. it we've, we must, you know, as I was reading through these prophecies this week, I was reading about how Jesus at the time is going to come, and they're going to cast you out of the synagogue, and they're going to throw you before rulers. And he said, in that moment, don't even think in advance what you're going to say, but the Holy Spirit is going to basically give you what to say in that moment. I thought, wow, you know, whenever we go stand, and you just think, I want you to really consider this. If, if you, not, not, not your husband with you, not your child, not your parent, but if you had to stand before a judge and answer for your beliefs, what would you do? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me let me get on the phone here. I got. I'm a, you know, now this, this isn't, you know, call a friend to bail you out. No, no. This is what are you going to say in that trial? And they start asking you questions about your beliefs, about the law of God, about the Sabbath particularly. Will you be able to give answers that 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 are, that are from God's word? Or will you just have the simple answer, well, that's what I've always believed. I grew up with that. I don't know any different. Because if you don't have, let me make this very clear, if you do not have a solid biblical answer for the reason for your faith, you know how easy it is to cower and to compromise? And when they start bringing persecution down and threatening you with imprisonment, threatening you with not allowing you to buy or sell, and then finally threatening you with death? Do you think you're going to stand for something you can't even prove from the Bible? We must make sure that our teachings are biblical, Christ-centered, truth. Do they? Why are you, I'm assuming most of you here are Seventh-day Adventists. If you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm going to say welcome today to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My message is for Adventists today, mostly. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Is it because you've never heard anything else? Have you studied it out for yourself? Do you know this because you know it to be true or because you, eh, you know, seem to make sense to me? I pray for God to bring us through small tests so that when we come to the big test, we'll be ready. You guys want some pop quizzes in life? <laughs> uh, you always like it when the teacher tells you in advance about what the test is coming, right? Who likes a pop quiz? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I've never been a fan of them myself. Whew. We looked at last week, we looked at the, um, the difference between physical and literal Israel, and we looked at the difference between spiritual and in true Israel in the last days. We really need to know that difference, friends. I think, it's, I think it's a pivotal point of prophecy. So if you didn't hear my message last week, go on our, our live stream channel and go check it out. And uh, make sure that you, you really get a good grasp of what Israel is in these last days. What I want to look at today is we're going to take a little, uh, get the microscope out, and we're going to look a little closer at what true Israel is. We're not going to try to make a case about the church being Israel, but we're, we're just going to look at what would Israel look like if we found them. So to do that, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. We're going to take a kind of an in-depth look at chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. If you're familiar with Revelation 12, you'll know that this is about God's church. But the context is, this isn't just about God's church. It specifically leads up to talking about what God's church looks like in the last days. All right, Revelation 12. We're going to spend some time looking at what, what do God's people look like today. We're going to begin by looking in verse 1. You got your Bibles? I'm not going to have the verses on the screen here. We got to get used to getting our Bibles open. If you only have a, one, a digital Bible, please scroll there. I like a good handheld Bible uh, with papers crinkling. At least I can hear you when you're turning pages. When you're scrolling, it's so silent. I don't personally have a problem with digital Bibles, but uh, 
if I did have one gripe about them, it's that it's so easy to be distracted. You know, a notification pops up while you're reading a verse. The Holy Spirit's trying to speak to you, and ding, oh, what's this? You know? <laughs> so, you know, when you're reading your Bible, you're using your, your uh, phone as a, to study with, your tablet, uh, turn off those notifications if you can, and just focus in on the Word of God today. All right, Revelation 12, verse 1. Let's look at, look at it. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. What do we got here? We've got a woman. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? I'm talking to Bible prophecy students already. You probably know this. What does a woman represent? A church. We know this consistently in the Bible. Jeremiah 6, verse 2. Isaiah 51, 16. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Ephesians 5, there in verse 22 and on, where it talks about husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Right? In Revelation, we see two women, right, representing churches. One a godly church, one a not-so-godly church there in Revelation chapter 17. But you'll notice about this woman that she is clothed with the sun. In fact, there are three elements of light associated with this woman. The sun, the moon, and the stars. All of them give off light, right? This woman, what, what does light represent in the Bible? Truth. Well, it represents truth, specifically based on Psalm 119, 105, right? It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So yes, it is the truth, but it's the truth that emanates from God's living word and his written word as well. So we have this woman, this church is a church of the Word, a church of the book, the Bible. This is a church that its very foundation, it, it's, it's over its head, and even shining from its body is God's Word, His true church. But now, specifically looking at the different elements here, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of different speculation on some of these things, but, but the moon reflects the light of the sun. And so some have suggested that, that the moon reflect, is really the Old Testament that the, that the church is standing on. You can read this in Ephesians chapter 4, where it says that the church uh, stands on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But specifically, uh, or excuse me, the, um, yeah, the apostles and prophets, but talking about the Old Testament, where the church's foundation is God's word from the Old Testament. Okay, so now look at the t- garland of 12 stars, or the 12 stars on uh, this woman's head. Why would it be 12 stars? So the 12 tribes of Israel. What other number 12 do we encounter in the Scriptures? The 12 apostles, right? So you have the 12 tribes, you have the 12 apostles. Well, as we look at this woman, we call her the church. And by the way, she was the church, but she was the church in the Old Testament. What was the church in the Old Testament called? It was called Israel. Israel. This woman, I'm going to make it very clear. I'm going to maybe use some different terms that you're used to in talking about this woman. This woman is Israel. This woman, she's, she's got that 12 stars. And by the way, you, you know the story that, that uh, Joseph had? Remember that? He had the, the, the dream about the, the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him in his dream. Who was the sun, moon, and stars in that? That was, that was, the, that was, the, that was Israel, his family. Literally, his dad, Israel, but, but all the brothers, right, as well, bowing down as, uh, uh, to him in that story. So we know that even that symbol was used of Israel in the past. So you have these 12 tribes. And then you find um, of the 144,000 is 12 times 12,000, the 12,000 uh, of the different 12 tribes, right? And then you have the 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, each gate representing what? One of the 12 tribes, So it seems to me that the only people going through those gates, it's Israel. Okay, this is 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 very interesting. Okay, we've we've been talking during Sabbath school about the covenants. Do you know who the new covenant is for? The new covenant is not for for Gentiles. You can read about it in the book of Hebrews in chapter 8, Hebrews 8. It tells you exactly who the new covenant is for. I'm just going to briefly read it to you here. Hebrews 8, and it's verse 10. It's also in verse 10. Uh, But Hebrews 8, it says, verse 8, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Who's the new covenant made with? The house of Israel. Friends, unless we become Israel, we will not 
be partaking of the new covenant. That's a very interesting thought. In fact, didn't Jesus come along? Didn't he say salvation is of the Jews? I think he meant that primarily in the sense that Jesus became through the lineage of the Jewish nation, right? So that's where salvation comes from. But friends, we need to be converted and become spiritual Jews to obtain salvation. All right, let's go on back to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to work our way through this here. Going on to verse 2, it says, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Who is this woman? It's Israel, right? So who is the child? This child is Jesus, who was born a Jew to the Jewish church. Jesus is that child. Uh, the it's incredible. This prophecy is so powerful. You're going to see in just a moment. Verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and drew, threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Okay, so she's ready to give birth. Okay, this woman, is, she's, this is the Jewish nation. The Messiah is about to come to devour the child as soon as it was born. Now, we know the history. You can go back to the book of Matthew. You can read about uh, King Herod and, and, and his plot to destroy Jesus right when he was born. Remember? That's when he, the Magi didn't come back. And so now he's, they, they got this plan to, uh, you know, couldn't kill Jesus individually. So we're just going to kill every child in all of Bethlehem, right? Who was Herod? Herod was the Roman government. Who was this dragon? Right. Well, we know it's Satan because it goes on later on and tells us, this, in verse 9, that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole earth. But this dragon is represented through the nation of Rome. In fact, we see this in the book of Daniel. Remember, how you have the four beasts in Daniel, the, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and this great ferocious beast. That ferocious and, and terrible beast with iron teeth, that's like the dragon here of Revelation. Again, it's Rome, but it's, it's Satan working through Rome to try to destroy the Messiah, even before he was born. Of course, after he was born, the persecution continues. And then look at this. It says, verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So we have no doubt whatsoever about who this child is. We know this is, of course, Jesus who ascends back into heaven. But here's where a transition point takes place. Up to this point, we've got some spiritual and literal things connected, right? The child is a literal child, Jesus. The woman represents Israel as a nation. Fit literal Israel. Physical Israel. But what happened shortly after Jesus went to heaven? We know what happened in AD 34. The prophecy was that, that he would confirm, the, uh, in Daniel chapter 9, that he would confirm a covenant with many for one week. We know that that covenant was that seven year period from the baptism of Jesus to the stoning of Stephen, those seven years from 27, AD 27 all the way to AD 34. In the middle of that week, the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. We know that uh, he was crucified for our sakes, right? But Jesus would confirm that covenant for seven years. Hebrews chapter 2 says that uh, the, the first part of that covenant would be confirmed by Jesus, but that the second part would be confirmed, um, the second part of that covenant would be confirmed by those who heard him. And so that seven-year period of extended mercy and grace to the Jewish nation. But finally, in the stoning of Stephen, they rejected God's grace, and the nation of Israel was cut off, and the times of the Gentiles began. So at this point, this is verse 6 and on, because this, after this, um, Jesus goes back to heaven. Look in verse 6. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So it fast forward to the period of time where this woman, the church, Israel now, not, not physical Israel, but now spiritual Israel, flees into the wilderness. She flees into, do you see the transition? It was physical Israel, and now it's spiritual Israel. By the way, physical Israel at that point in AD 70, there was the, the great dispersion whenever uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. Many of the Jews were killed and, and they, were, they were scattered to the four winds. The, 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 the literal Jewish nation was. 
And so, uh, verse, well, so then, okay, then you have the 1260 year period. Now, this is a time period mentioned seven times in Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Seven times this 1260 year period is mentioned. You got the times, times, and dividing of times, the 42 months, the 1260 days, all of the same period, a day representing a year in prophecy, is talking about the church in the wilderness for, for 1260 years. Where was the wilderness for these 1260 years? It was, well, it was throughout Europe. The church found refuge in the different uh, mountain fastnesses of Europe and, and, and the caves and out in the, uh, the, 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 the forests. God's people found a refuge. Now, there's like an intermission here. Verse, verses 7 through 12 of, Daniel, of Revelation chapter 12, it's, a, um, it's kind of a, a miniature repeat and enlarged story. It goes back and kind of gives you a history of where this dragon came from, and then the story continues on. So we're going to skip that for now. We're going to pick up, the, pick up there in verse 13 where the dragon begins to persecute the woman. You see here it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now, he was trying to persecute Jesus, but he couldn't get Jesus. Jesus is now in heaven. And if you can't get Jesus, you get the next best thing, right? That's his bride, the one he loves, his beloved. And you, you, know, you, 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 you can mess with me all day long. I'm not going to retaliate. You, you, know, you, can mess with, you can mess with me, and by God's grace, I'll turn the other cheek. When I was serving time in prison, I had to turn the other cheek a couple times. But... You mess with my wife, you're asking for trouble, right? Husbands, amen? <laughs> you mess with the wife of Jesus, and you're really asking for trouble. And that's what Satan, he, start, he turned his attention from Christ to the bride of Christ. And so verse 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Notice that word, her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. So God protected, again, this is reiterating, God protected this woman. During the 1260 years of papal persecution, the church was in the wilderness. The church was in hiding. This was God. When I say the church, every time I say the church, you can hear me say Israel. Because that's who this was. Israel was in hiding during the 1260 years. Yeah. Now, I want you to notice three things about this place, okay? Number one, after Jesus goes back to heaven, God's church, the woman, transitions from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. Very important. In fact, I may be, I got these things on the screen. No, I'm not there yet. Okay. Number two, God's church, the woman, she moves from literal Palestine, okay, to the place God has given her, right? So she's no, so Israel's no longer in Israel. Did you get that? Israel is no longer in Palestine. Israel is now in her place, which we learn is the wilderness of Europe. And number three, this woman becomes the focal point of end time prophecy. We got to figure out who this woman is to even understand Revelation chapter 12. I mean, you got some people over there teaching that that woman is Mary. Other people teach it's literal Israel all the way to the very end. It doesn't fit. If we get this wrong, friends, we're going to be focusing on the wrong people. We're going to be focusing on the wrong place, which is what we see happening today. So back in verse 6, in verse 12, or sorry, 6 and verse 14, we see this, this wilderness as a place where God protects his people during the dark ages, that 1260 years where God's people are protected. Well, they're persecuted, but they're not completely annihilated. In fact, they were able to be persecuted by the papal power. But I want you to now look really closely at verse 14, because this is really gets exciting, really gets interesting, because it's bringing it closer to our day. Verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and at times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. Sorry, verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. So, so what does water represent in prophecy? 
people mold, people multitudes, nations, right? Tongues. So you have this, you have great populations. And so here, God's people were under persecution, and we're coming to the end of the 1260-year prophecy, right? Which we know ended in 1798. And toward the end of this time, Satan unleashes the, the, these floodgates, and this flood of people tries to attempt to stamp out this, this movement of Christianity, which we, we know later on as Protestantism and such. And watch what happens. Verse 16, but the earth helped the woman. The earth helped the woman. Don't miss that word earth right there. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Friends, God, now, I'm not going to be able to get into Revelation chapter 13 today. But in Revelation 13, you have two beasts. The first beast we know is the papal power. The second beast, the beast with lamb-like horns, the beast that comes up out of where? The earth. This beast we know is the United States of America. It's the beast that, that, that starts off lamb-like with the principles of Protestantism, the, the principles of, of of um, republicanism, right? This, this idea of uh, we're no longer under a monarchy. We're no longer under a pope. And the second beast comes up out of the earth, the earth being in contrast to the, multi, the populated places of the earth. And so you have here this earth, the same earth in Revelation 13 is what opens up its mouth and swallows up this flood. And that's where God's people find freedom, as they seek freedom away from the persecution uh, that had hid them in the, in the wilderness for so many years, for the 1260 years, now they're finding refuge here in this country. Who is finding refuge? Israel is. Now, not Israel according to the flesh, but Israel according to the Spirit. God's church comes here to this nation to find freedom. This is the new place that God gives to save his people. Now I want to take you to verse 17. And the dragon, he didn't give up. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing about the devil you got to give him credit for. He's persistent. He is tenacious. He doesn't give up. I like the King James phrasing this because it uses a word, a very powerful word, the word remnant. Let's read it again. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now we know what that word remnant means because we claim we are the remnant, right? The remnant means the last remaining part. We've, we're come down now to the end of earth's history. The, but I want you to understand in the context of Israel, and God used the word remnant of Israel several times in the Old Testament. As, as you, know, of all, you know, Elijah was a remnant of Israel. God had 7,000 that had not bowed their knees to Baal. They were the remnant of Israel. Remember the prophet had hidden 500, or was it 50? I think it was 50 of the prophets, 50 or 500, I think it was 50 of the prophets. He hid them in caves. They were the remnant. They were what was left over after the rest had apostatized. Today, God has a remnant church. He has a remnant Israel, a group of people who are standing faithful to God. And look how it describes them right here. It says that they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Don't miss that, friends. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They have this gift, the testimony of Jesus Christ we know from Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Yeah, by the way, I'm, spending, I'm not spending a lot of time going in depth on this because you know these things already. But I'm highlighting this in the context that if we want to be modern Israel, we must live up to what Israel is expected to do, which is what? Keeping the commandments of God. And they also are a church of prophecy. Revelation chapter 19, 10 talks about how uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. This is important because the, the focus of, and that's my next slide now, the focus of end time prophecy is this end time woman. How does she live? What does she look like? What is she doing? Is this the only time we get a picture of this end time woman? I don't think so. I think actually we get a picture of her as we look at the 144,000. I want you to think about this. The 144,000. Now, I don't, uh, like most of you, 
I don't have all the details about the 144,000. We, we all know what the Bible says, but the application in detail is not really given. But we can come to certain conclusions. The 144,000, they come from the 12 tribes of what? Israel. Now, are we talking, are they literal 12 tribes of Israel, or are they spiritual 12 tribes of Israel? Okay, so we're talking, thank you, it's spiritual Israel. Don't stop, just make sure they keep up. Physical Israel, okay, there's a problem here. If we read about the 12 tribes there in chapter 7, it lists them off. It lists all 12 tribes, but we come into a couple problems there. And the 12 tribes listed in, Daniel, or in Revelation chapter 7, there's a couple tribes that we would expect to be there that are missing. You have the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim. Two very important tribes. Anywhere in the Old Testament you see a list of the 12 tribes, they're always in those lists. Ephraim and Dan, both of them. But guess what? They're missing. They're not in the list. And if you're a student of prophecy, you maybe know why the story of Dan and Ephraim, both of them you know, joining to idols and getting into their messes and rebellion. And even Ephraim became uh, Israel of the north, kind of uh, was called Ephraim. And so they just, they, they represent a rebellion. So Dan and Ephraim aren't in the list. But now if you, if you have 12, but you take out two, it leaves you with 10, how are you going to get back to 12? Well, you've got to add two in. Well, how do you add two in? Well, one of them they add in here in Revelation chapter 12 is the tribe of Levi. Now, you find the 12 tribes of Israel. Levi was one of the 12 sons of Israel, but Levi was never mentioned among the 12 tribes. Why? Because they were to be the, the, the teachers and the leaders in the, uh, uh, throughout Israel. And they inherited not different portions of Israel, but they inherited these six different cities and uh, cities of refuge. And they, became, and they spread all throughout Israel as their teachers. So Levi is represented among these 12, which is very unique. And then there's another tribe in there. In fact, there's a tribe listed in there that is listed nowhere else in the entire Bible. Does anybody know what that tribe is? No, Manasseh is one of the 12 tribes. Oh. It's the tribe of Joseph. The tribe of, now, what's really interesting about Joseph is Joseph was the parent of Manasseh and of Ephraim. So what's interesting is, is in this list, you have Manasseh and you have Joseph, I keep saying, yeah, Joseph. Joseph and Manasseh are essentially the same tribe, right? So my, my whole point in bringing up this is just to make, the, make the, 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 I think, the clear observation that we're not talking literal Israel. We're talking spiritual Israel because literal just doesn't fit. In fact, of those 12 tribes, even the ones that are listed, do you know how many of those actually around the world today say, hey, by the way, I, I can trace my, my, my lineage back to Asher and to... Um, what, to Simeon and, and all the others? No, nobody's doing that because those, those records have been lost. Now, there are people who say that they can trace their lineage back through the Jewish line, right? And some of them say through the, even the Levitical line. And that may be true. I, I don't know. But regardless, you don't have 12,000 from 12, uh, you don't have 12 tribes with 12,000 people each from literal tribes that do not exist. So we know we're talking spiritual Israel. And so I believe this, this 144,000 is literally talking about the same as the Israel of Revelation chapter 12, the one that was in the Old Testament that now is the Israel of the New Testament. And what about this Israel? I mean, in Revelation chapter 7, it says that, she, that, that this Israel, that they are sealed with the seal of the living God, and it calls them servants. And then Revelation chapter 14, it describes them in detail, talking about many of their characteristics. But I really like the last of Revelation chapter 14. It says that they are, the, as it describes the 144,000 there, it says they are without deceit. There's no guile in their mouths. And then it says they are without fault before the throne of God. 144,000 without fault. That reminds me of the the benediction given in the book of Jude, without fault. Look what it says, Jude 24, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. All right. God can do that, right? But he does that with the 144,000. And if you want to be part of the 144,000, if you want to be part of the Israel in the last days, this remnant church of God, 
then he's looking for you to keep the commandments, to be without fault before God, to not have any guile in your mouth. There's so many, so many beautiful characteristics here, but I guess I'm really just belaboring the point that this is the people of God that are responsible for representing God's character in the last days. And, you know, whether it's a literal number or a, physic, or a, or a uh, literal number or a spiritual number, 144,000, uh, I'll do that for maybe another Bible study. I do have some strong opinions about it. But regardless of whether it's a literal or figurative number, we are told to strive to be part of that group. So, strive to be part of that group. Be part of the 144,000. It is an invitation. And friends, I believe if you are alive when Jesus Christ comes back and you're faithful and you look up and say, this is our God, we've waited for him, this is our uh, God, he will save us, then friends, you will be part of that 144,000. But notice this is the 144,000. This is the same group of people that are responsible for proclaiming the three angels' messages just before the harvest. When you read Revelation 14, the first five verses are about the 144,000. Then verses 6 through 12 is about the three angels' messages. And then the rest of the chapter is about the harvest of of Christ's second coming. So who's responsible for preaching the three angels' messages? Israel. And I believe specifically the 144,000 as it leads right up to the coming of Jesus. That's whenever this message is going to be proclaimed in boldness. The second angel's message especially. We read Revelation chapter 18. Come out of Babylon is the message. Are you preaching the three angels' messages? Are you keeping the commandments of God? And it goes on in Revelation. I guess I have it here on the screen, don't I? Revelation 14, 12. This is the third angel's message. Here's the patience of the saints. These saints, this is God's people. This is Israel. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Oh, I want to go in more depth on that, but I can't. Jesus is coming soon, friends. And he has set apart a church to represent him just like he set apart Israel to represent him. Now remember, why did God set apart Israel? We talked about it in Sabbath school this morning, Deuteronomy 7, 7, and 8. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. Oh, thank you. You got already had it up there. Taking care of me up there. He says, I did not set, God says, he did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than other people for you were the least of the peoples. But Because the Lord loves you. I'm going to say this to Seventh-day Adventists. Don't think you're special because you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You're special because God loves you. You may, and for those that are born into this church, in a lot of ways I envy you, having the privilege of being raised up with Adventist parents who shows you right from wrong, who, who got to teach you, you. You got to know about the Sabbath from like a kid. How cool is that? I, hope, I want my kids to be raised up in the Seventh-day Adventist home, okay? Nothing wrong with being born into an Adventist home. But God doesn't have grandchildren. You know what I mean by that? Anybody who's going to heaven must themselves become a child of God. They have to have their own relationship with Jesus Christ. God's raising up a generation of people, a church that will reflect God's glory, that will shine his light across this world. God loves you. Hey, Pat. (laughs) And he's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan in these last days. Friends, we have the privilege of living in the most unique period in earth's history. We got the pri- Imagine being alive when Jesus Christ is walking the earth for three and a half years. Wouldn't that have been very cool? Or being able to see Moses in his day. All those things are awesome, and I think it would be amazing to, to see Jesus at work in his ministry. But only one generation is going to be able to see Christ come in the sky. And I think you're going to be that generation. All the signs are telling us, friends, He is coming soon. Now, remember why he chooses us? Not because we're special, not because we're unique, because we're extra good. We're the least of all people. We are the least of all people, just like it says. But 
He loves us. And friends, I want you to understand this. That's what grace is. And in fact, I'm going to share this with you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, uh, especially it says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we are saved by grace, right? The only reason we are con- be considered Israel today is because we've been adopted in. He's accepted us even though we aren't natural born children. But that's not where it ends. Look at verse 10. You know this one already, but listen. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should do what? Walk in them. God wants you to walk in the good works that he has before ordained. And what are those good works? Well, we've already talked about it in Revelation. We know it's the Ten Commandments. We know the good works include serving others and being kind. But friends, those good works also means to share the everlasting gospel with the world. Here's my appeal. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He was bringing them into the promised land. Amen? Later on, when they got in trouble, God took them out of the promised land into captivity in Babylon. And when the time was come, God said, just the same as he said to the Pharaoh, let my people go, in so many words. And so God's people left Babylon. They came out of Babylon back to the promised land where God had a place prepared for them. Today, God is calling people out of Babylon back to Israel, back to the promised land. And I'm not talking about, and I, I, I wanted to talk about Daniel chapter 11 a day. <laughs> not going to be able to do it. The glorious holy mountain. God is bringing his people back out of Babylon. And that's the final call. The call that goes to all the world. A call that God is asking you to participate in. He wants you to be his voice. He wants you to be one of the three angels' messages. Three angels as a messenger, right? He wants you to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This everlasting gospel. To call people out of Babylon. Because Babylon has fallen. It has fallen. Warning people about the mark of the beast. So here's my appeal. God is bringing people out of Babylon today into the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is it a perfect church? Was was Israel messed up? (laughs) Yes. The answer is yes. And let me tell you something. The Seventh-day Adventist church is not a perfect church. I know. Because I'm a member of it. But it yet remains God's people. It is the apple of his eye today. You're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Please, pray for the literal nation over there. They need your prayers. But friends, we need to be praying for this people. God's people. We need to be praying for unity. We need to be praying for for God to build up this church, for God to give us boldness to preach our message across the world. We need to be praying for, uh, for us to put away any sins that we may have in our midst. We need revival, amen? We need reformation as a church. Are we praying for this Jerusalem? We are the bride of Christ. By the way, the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. But right now, we are Zion. We are Jerusalem. And God wants to save Jerusalem. If you've not yet been a part of this church... If you have not joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, if you've not become part of it and yoked yourself together with God's last day people who keep his commandments and who have the faith of Jesus, my invitation to you, if you surrender your life to Jesus, if you have a love for truth and a love for God's commandments, then you're invited to become part of this church. And I just want to say, if anybody out there today is sensing the Lord saying, hey, I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, don't hesitate. Come talk to me. Come talk to one of the elders of this church. You have a friend here? Talk to him. Say, hey, look, let's, let's do Bible studies. Let's do, what do I have to do? Boy, if, if I was a member of this church, you'd have to fight to keep me away. I'd be, I'd be like jumping in that baptismal tank. I'm ready, Pastor. I love this church. 
Be part of this movement. Now, if you've been an Adventist, so this is, I'm going to talk to Adventists again. I was talking to non-Adventists for just a second there. I'm going to talk back to Adventists again. If you've been a lukewarm or even a backslidden Adventist, it's time to get your act together. They don't look at the person next to you or across the aisle. Today is the time to look at ourselves. The Bible says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith, whether you be in the faith. Throw yourself at the feet of Jesus. Call out to him. He is waiting and longing to forgive you of your sins, no matter how ugly and bad they are. And to put you like a gem in his crown in his church. He's calling today for Joshua's. He's calling for Caleb's. He's looking for Moses's. He's looking for Daniel's, Elijah's, John the Baptist's. Will you take the call? Will you heed the invitation? Remember John the Baptist? What did he say? He saw these Israelites coming to him. He said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He said, oh, at first he calls them a, a brood of vipers. I love David Asher. He calls them, a, he says, he's a herd of snakes. Who, flee, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? But bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. That's what I'm asking today, friends. Is there something you need to be repenting of? Do you need to fall again at the foot of Jesus? He won't just forgive you, friends. He will cleanse you. He will restore you. And he will make something out of your life. Don't you want that? I know I want that, friends. I want that very badly. Now, with that said, we need to pray. We need to sing. And we need to go to work for the Lord. Can we do that? Let's begin with prayer. Father, Make us into the Israel that ancient Israel failed to be. Take this, this church, this body of, of believers that, that, that are sometimes, well, many times, fall short of your expectations, God. And please, start here in New Albany and create revival that will spread throughout this entire world. Reach into our own hearts, Lord, and convert us. Help us to be the Israel of the last days. It lives up to all the light you've given. And Father, if there's anybody today that's really considering to be part of this church, give them no rest or no peace until they have made that full commitment to you, to unite themselves with your body of believers, that they would give their efforts and strength and influence for your cause. Lord, we pray for Israel, your church. Be in our midst. Work through us. Bring us revival. Cleanse us. For, Lord, we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.